Jesus' way. And he said, no, not really. I don't really do board appointment stories on Ring of Cabinet. It's just not interesting enough for, for the readers. And then she said, well, you might want to take a look at this one. So she sent me over the press release that had Larry Summers being announced as the new board member. And I just thought, wow. Suddenly, this piece of ministry has raised its profile. And sure enough, in the next day or two, pretty much every major news publication uh, in this country covered the story of, of uh, Larry Summers joining the Ring Club board. So he, uh, he is obviously someone who most of us uh, know of. He is the former Secretary of the Treasury under President Clinton. He's the former President of Harvard. He is the former Director of the National Economic Council under President Obama. And he's currently the Charles W. Elliott University Professor at Harvard. And, he, and as he shared on Twitter last night, and his, his uh, Twitter handle for everyone who's interested, it's at LH Summers. As he shared on Twitter last night, what he's going to be talking about today is why we are finally seeing financial innovation that is for the benefit of consumers. And also he's going to be discuss how policymakers need to articulate first principles for approaching regulation of the marketplace of lending industry. So please join me in welcoming current Lending Club board member, Larry Summers. This is a great privilege uh, to be here. And I have to say the size of this crowd, the entrepreneurial energy in this room, the extent of the dialogue and the deals being cut in these corridors gives me hope for the future of the lending industry, gives me hope for the renewal of the American financial industry, and gives me hope for the future of our economy global economy. And that is even without mentioning, Peter, my gratitude for having been introduced without the usual economist joke. It was not so long ago that I was introduced by the guy who said, Larry, do you know what it takes to succeed as an economist? And I said, no. And he said, an economist is someone who's pretty good with figures, but does not quite have the personality to be an economist. That was in Moscow. No one got the joke. Here's what I'd like to do today. I'd like to talk to you about why I think this is a challenging time for the American economy. Talk to you about why I think the conventional financial sector has, in, in important respects, let all its main constituents down over the last generation. Talk to you about how I believe that technology-based businesses have the opportunity to transform finance over the next generation and reflect with you on the principles that should guide public policy with respect to the sector going take great satisfaction. I can tell you I was there that if you look at any important economic statistic between the fall of 2008 and the spring of 2009, GDP, industrial production, unemployment, anything, it was worse than it had been after the fall of 1929. The trend was faster and further down than it had been after the fall of 1929. Depression was a real possibility. Thanks to a combination of the vitality of the American economy and the policies that were put in place, we have not seen anything like a to 
expressed with very considerable concern at what has happened to the economy. Today, the GDP of the United States is about 10%, or $1.6 trillion less than people expected it to be in 2015 as of 2007. That $1.6 trillion uh, loss represents about $20,000 for the average family of four. And that loss is taking place each year. And that loss is taking place against the backdrop of the United States that is doing relatively well compared to the global economy, particularly to the economy of the rest of the industrialized world. If you look at markets, something quite remarkable is the case. In Europe, the 10-year interest rate in Germany is 18 basis points. In Japan, it is comfortably below 50 basis points. In the United States, it is below 2%. And if you look at real interest rates, that is, interest rates adjusted for inflation, they are negative in Europe and Japan, and about 20 basis points in the United States for a 10-year period. What does that tell us? And all of that sloshing in all of that money, sloshing into government bonds to the point where their yield is negative, is telling us that despite all the opportunities that exist in the modern world, markets are seeing some kind of chronic excess of savings that is not being effectively channeled into investment. Failure means less investment, which means less growth. And that lower growth, in turn, means more pessimistic expectations, which means less failure, means less investment, which means less growth. And that lower growth, in turn, What is the function of the financial system in a modern economy? The function of a financial system is to finance those who want to put off consumption, whether it is for a rain, to prepare for a rainy day, to send a child to college, to accumulate wealth, to build a house, to prepare for retirement, or to look out for one's children. It is to take those who wish to defer consumption and save, and in order, though, in order to put those resources to good use among the large number of people who should have good use for resources, living in a house before they've accumulated the wealth equal to the value of the house, putting in place necessary public infrastructure, doing productive investment that raises the productivity of large number of workers. And it is the task of the financial system to make that connection. And if what we see, if what we see is that that connection is not being made, and so we are seeing lower levels of investment, lower levels of interest rates, that has to raise a question as to 
how well the mainstream financial system is functioning. But one can raise a question about how well the mainstream financial system is uh, functioning in a more direct set of ways. Is it meeting the needs of borrowers? Well, small business lending is a much smaller fraction of total bank lending than it was 15 years ago. And small businesses, not just in the United States, but in most parts of the industrialized world, report themselves to still be experiencing a credit crunch. Home ownership rates in the United States have fallen behind by a generation. It is appropriate and right that credit is not nearly as available for mortgages as it was in 2005 or 2006 or 2004. It might be appropriate and right that it's not as available as it was in the early 2000s. It is surely not appropriate that credit is not nearly as available for middle class mortgage, middle class potential homeowners as it was in the late 1990s. It is not appropriate that private equity firms are leech, leaping huge profits by renting homes to homeowners who cannot get mortgage credit and charging them rent that equals 8 or 10 percent of the value of those properties. It could be that those people could be paying 3 or 4 or 5 percent of the value of those properties and enjoying the appreciation as well. If our financial system was doing a better job of providing credit. Credit is increasingly unavailable for those wishing to pursue higher education because of the great difficulties that the mainstream system has had in distinguishing better from worse risk. Renaud Laplante famously got the inspiration to start Lending Club by asking himself why it was in the modern technology age that if he put money in the bank, he got 2%, and if he tried to take money, if he tried to borrow money from the bank on his credit card, he paid 17%. And this was in the era of computers. Since Renault Laplante had that insight, spreads administrative costs in mainstream banks have risen, not fallen. So the first disappointing aspect of the mainstream financial system is that it has not succeeded and is succeeding less well than it once did in its basic function of providing credit to people. The second respect in which the mainstream financial system has let us down is that if you look over a long period of time, the returns earned by investors in large mainstream financial institutions have fallen way short of market returns for a number of institutes, for those who invested 10 years ago or 20 years ago on a long-term buy and hold uh, basis in a number of institutions that we can all name, the return has been negative 100% because they lost all their money. Those who invested in a number of other institutions that still function on a large scale today have lost more than 80% of their money 
given the losses and the dilution associated with the financial crisis. On average, returns have fallen far, far short of the S&P 500. So the financial system hasn't worked so well for the benefit of its customers. Borrowing is hard. It isn't working so well for the benefit of its creditors. You don't earn any money anymore when you deposit money in a bank. And it hasn't worked so well for the benefit of its, um, and it hasn't, and it hasn't worked uh, so well uh, for the benefit of its share owners either. It also hasn't worked so well for the rest of us. Think about the last long generation. We saw the Latin American debt crisis that brought the major financial institutions to the brink. We saw the 1987 stock market crash. We saw the uh, SNL debacle. We saw the New York City real estate crash. We saw the 1994-1995 Mexican financial collapse. We saw the 1997 Asian financial crisis. We saw the 1998 LTCM Russia episode. We saw the 2000 internet bubble. We saw the 2001-2002 Enron long-term uh, long, uh, long, uh, long high-yield bond debacle. And all of that was free. part of that effort involves public policy, it involves government regulation, it involves the financial system, it involves human welfare, it involves government, it involves public policy, it involves the government, it involves private sector, it involves the 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 private sector
than if you have all the, if you have access to all of the Harvard Library. I work at Harvard. He gave me my choice: no smartphone and free access to the Harvard Library 24 hours a day, or free access or um, uh, full access to my smartphone, but no longer any access to the Harvard Library. That would not be a hard choice. And if you think about the ability to be in touch and connect with people around the world, you would rather have this device than have the White House communication system as it stood when John Kennedy was president of the United States. And here's the remarkable thing. There will be a date. It might be three years from now. It might be seven years. when there will be more smartphones on Earth than there are adults. Now, admittedly, that's in part because there are going to be some people in Hong Kong who have four. But we are not far from the day when almost everyone on Earth will have a smartphone. That is a moment of extraordinary information technology uh, innovation. We do not know and we cannot forecast all the forms that it will take. There was a very good book, or at least it's tried to be a very good book, that was written um, by a Harvard colleague of mine, an MIT professor, in 2004. And it was an attempt to look very carefully and very thoughtfully What would still be the domain of the human brain, and what it would be a long time before technology could replace it. And they chose a canonical example of something that was easy for humans, but hard for technology. That canonical example was making a left turn in the face of oncoming. Google solved that problem three to five years after those sentences were written. We do not yet know all the technology will be able to do. We do know this. Um, it's a good law for thinking about the world, whether you're thinking about the arrival of financial crises or you're thinking about the dissemination of uh, technology. We know things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then they happen faster than you thought they could. That's the way it was with the housing bubble collapsing. That's the way it was with the pervasiveness of the personal computer. That's the way it was with the internet becoming part of the fabric of all of our daily more for the benefit of money than they have been for the benefit of people. Paul Volcker was not exaggerating very much if he was exaggerating at all when he said four or five years ago that there hadn't been an important financial innovation since the 1880s. I joined the Lending Club board and the scream that is 
represented by all of you in this room. The application of information technology takes friction value and makes finance work better. And in particular, though this is not the only sphere where this is important, to do so with respect to lending, I believe has the potential to over time be transformative of the financial system and to address its infirmities that I described. those infirmities, frictions that were too large, that represented too large a gap between what savers, savers receive and what borrowers pay. Banking functions without banks. Offer or Lending Club and many others have demonstrated the opportunity to take 3%, 5%, 6% .5 out of the cost of intermediation. And for investors who drive that innovation to receive a substantial return, even as there are substantial benefits both to savers. Second benefit is that the systematic use of data on a large scale will permit better credit judgment, and that will permit the more accurate allocation of capital. The more accurate allocation of capital means higher returns which is good for the providers of capital. It means that capital will be available to the previously unrecognized credit worthy. It means that those who are credit worthy but have not yet been able to prove themselves to be credit worthy will now be given opportunities to prove themselves to be credit worthy and enter the mainstream and see their borrowing costs decline over time. It means that capital will be allocated more wisely, which means that there will be more efficiency in its use, which ultimately means more jobs and better products throughout the economy. Some of that's going to come from better use of existing data. Some of that will come from harnessing data streams that were previously available. I'm privileged to serve also on the board of uh, Square. Square has an important new product, Square Capital, that lends to small business but with the informational and enforcement advantages that come from handling all of their credit card charges, which permits them to make much lower cost loans available and to make decisions more rapidly. These benefits, these, uh, the use of technology has a third major it provides a much more satisfactory kind of consumer experience. We live in a society because of all the ways in which we are conditioned. When all of us are less patient than we would have been a generation ago. One manifestation of that is that if you watch the evening news, the average film clip of somebody being interviewed is now eight seconds. 
1968 was a minute and three seconds. Well, that growing impatience means that if we apply for a loan, we want to know the answer to yes or no now, not yes or no in the mail three weeks from now. We want to interact with institutions who don't ask for our trust, but earn our trust through the efficiency with which they deal with us. And if you look at the performance scores of firms like Lending Club, in contrast to the favorability ratings from consumers of large uh, banks, it is an ocean of uh, difference. And so these models offer a better consumer experience, more informed allocation of credit, substantially reduced friction, and I believe they have the opportunity also to contribute to greater financial stability in our economy. They have the ability to contribute to greater financial stability in several ways. First, the basic lesson of the field of ecology. A lot of things you learn in the field of ecology, but if there's one take home lesson from ecology, it is this diverse ecosystems are much more resilient than uniform. A financial system in which credit is provided by banks, credit is provided through traditional capital markets, credit is provided through platform uh, lenders, credit is provided through specialty finance vehicles uh, supported by information technology. A financial system that is more diverse will be a financial system that is more stable. It is a financial system that will be more free of the positive feedback loop that happens when credit contracts and therefore asset values decline and therefore credit contracts and therefore asset values decline and it happens again and again. If we can have more resilience in the basic provision of credit through more diversity, we can have a more stable financial system. Platform lending doesn't have the central connection to leverage that traditional banking does. There is no entity that carries the balance sheet with leverage. There's nothing there that is too big to fail. There is nothing there that requires deposit insurance. There is nothing there that is implicitly subsidized. There is therefore a greater contribution to stability, to the kind of stability that uh, we seek to achieve. And better information technology and better credit decisions mean less risk of uh, failure. And that too is a contributor. I believe that the financial system, traditional financial system, given its performance, is right for disruption. I believe that it is more than most sectors the moment for disruption, given success in information technology. And I believe that the nature of the incipient disruption, the use of information technology to lend in new ways, is directly responsive to the problems that have caused such dissatisfaction with the financial system over the last generation and that have contributed to 
our economic problems and those slow growth forecasts and those remarkably low uh, statistics. How should public policy view all of this? How should, what should be the posture of uh, public policy? I would suggest four precepts. They will not resolve every specific regulatory question. But I think if we are able to follow these four precepts, the future can be very bright, both for entrepreneurs and for almost everybody, because almost everybody is a stakeholder, one way or another, in the success of our financial system. What are those precepts? First, permission, not prohibition. Let new business models emerge. Regulators should allow new firms to operate, generating data on the outcomes created by novel business models before writing new rules. Yes, regulation is necessary, but only Presumption would be of permission rather than a presumption of prohibition. And I believe that is hugely important with respect to new information technology businesses generally, and it is important in particular with respect to uh, lending businesses. Second principle insist on transparency and disclosure. Then let consumers decide. As new lenders serve parts of the market that have historically not had access to uh, credit, high rates may draw regulatory scrutiny. Regulators should require full transparency and disclosure and see how consumers react to new products and prices. their credit without getting credit. That when they get credit, they have the opportunity to improve their credit. And we need to allow those with new business models seeking to reach new populations an opportunity to show what they can do as 
long as they do it with full transparency and full honesty. Third principle. Maintain a level playing field. Don't give incumbents an unfair advantage to discourage business models based on unfair regulatory arbitrage. Regulators should strive to put interests on equal footing with incumbents, but to do so without sacrificing consumer protection. No lending business, online or offline, should get a pass on usury laws, on fair lending requirements, on disclosure, or on other critical safeguards. At the same time, the unwillingness to operate in, or the choice to operate in non-traditional form should not mean an exemption from principles that have been regarded as appropriate to apply to all lenders. At the same time, However, it is essential that requirements that are no longer appropriate, like the requirement for uh, the monitoring of the balance sheets of banks, are not appropriate to institutions that do not have balance sheets that serve only as platforms. Fourth principle. Workable regulatory framework. To date, regulatory authorities have generally maintained appropriate attitudes towards innovative lenders. It will be important as the industry evolves and grows that regulators not create overhangs of uncertainty or burden excessively those attempting. those in this room and many, many beyond. That more importantly, it can mean that the basic function of a financial system to provide higher returns to savers, lower costs to borrowers, while permitting investments to drive the economy uh, forward can be performed better in the future than it has been in the past. Innovation in lending, along with innovation in payments, along with innovation in funding, along with innovation in the allocation of risk, I believe offers tremendous potential for making the American economy and the global economy not just more efficient, but more secure and more stable as well. And when I think about the magnitude of the problems and they are many, and I think about Occasional ossification of tradition in Washington. I know that while the right public policies are hugely important, that the task of renewal 
of our financial system is not primarily one for public policy. It is primarily one for entrepreneurial innovation. And that is why the size and growth of the lenders We're going. We're going to take uh, a couple of questions from the audience. We got the mic runners around. We got. Uh, where are the mic runners? Mic runners. Okay. Um, Paul, make one of you stand up. We got one over here. We must down the front. Hello, we got. One, we got big now, so come down the front. Okay, you go. Here's a group. We go with Paul Mac first. I talked about public policy and the macro economy and stuff is that I've learned from painful experience that when you talk to a group, it's usually better to talk about what you know about than it is to talk about what they know about. And I suspect there are quite a number of people in this room who could give a more educated estimate uh, than, uh, than I could. I suspect it differs from Forty percent of direct consumer lending was taking place in one way or another through uh, new businesses to get those to them. Um, that would not uh, that would not surprise me. If seventy five percent of direct mar of market lending, uh, leaving out government subsidized lending to small businesses, was taking place in ways other than through uh, traditional banks uh, a decade from now, that would, not, uh, that would not surprise me. If I had to guess for a variety of reasons, uh, mortgage finance may be somewhat more complicated, may be uh, somewhat more complicated, and so I would expect uh, somewhat lower uh, market shares in uh, mortgage finance. to do with the nature of technology than it does with uh, respect to the nature of uh, government choice. I think the heartening thing in a way for those of us who have some involvement with entrepreneurial businesses in this sphere is that uh, the ratio of where we are to the addressable market, even on fairly pessimistic definitions of the addressable market uh, suggests, uh, suggests to me uh, that there's uh, very, very substantial room uh, for uh, growth uh, in the years ahead. And of course, it's the remarkable feature of exponential growth that if you increase it 50 percent a year, the number of extra customers you're serving two years from now is more than twice as large as the number of incremental customers you're serving uh, this year. And 
I'd also suggest, uh, and here I'm sort of even further behind uh, my level of uh, consciousness, but in some ways, the potential for this innovation may be greatest around the world. And I'm sure there will be areas where these technologies will leapfrog traditional technologies in the same way that in many parts of the world there's never going to be a landmine fence. And I suspect in a variety of emerging markets, these kinds of bases for lending will become the orthodoxy before another orthodoxy is put in place. And one more question. That's a question of um, what about this industry and uh, monetary policy? I I could be wrong, and I'm sure if we wait long enough, I would we might turn out to be wrong. But my judgment is that monetary policy now increasingly is best thought of not as working through some concept called the money stock or some aggregate called credit, but is thought of as working through price. And the Fed basically uh, sets an interest rate at which it's both willing to borrow and to lend, and that becomes the base interest rate. And the presence of that base interest rate then influences economic activity. And I would be surprised if that basic understanding of monetary policy was to be changed even over a very long time on the basis of what happens in uh, the platform, uh, the, the platform money market. Let me take one more question. Okay, I'll go. Yes. I'm not sure you characterized either their views right or my views right. Um, so I'll do. So we'll leave them aside. We'll leave their very good book, which I would commend to everybody, aside. I'll just talk about my views. Look, I think technology is going to do phenomenal, phenomenal, remarkable things uh, going, uh, going, going forward. I think there are going to be all kinds of capacities some of which we imagine and some of which we don't, that are going to be enabled by technology. Uh, people thought that they'd only be used for six mainframe frame computers in the world. People couldn't really see why there'd be pervasive reasons for copying, for, uh, copying machines. AT&T estimated a worldwide market of 500,000 cell phones. Um, so people consistently get it wrong don't appreciate when you use technology to do new things rather than just to do old things better, what the full extent of the possibilities, what the full extent of the possibilities are. I do think there's a substantial chance that there's going to be a very large social challenge, which is going to be posed by the fact that technology is in increasingly going to substitute for the labor of very large groups of people in our society. It's going to substitute for middle management functions because it's basically going to be possible to keep track of things without going through machines. And what middle managers do is they don't conceive new strategies. What they do is they keep track of things. That's why they're called middle managers. And 
that's going to be possible with information technology. That robots and 3D printing are going to take over a large amount of what factory workers do. And that you see it, you know, if you, if you go to the new LaGuardia Airport, there's uh, lots more variety of food you can buy, but there are many fewer people around helping you get it because of all kinds of scanners and printers and whatnot. And you pay for it with your credit card with, with information technology. That's the future of the restaurant industry. That's the future of the retail industry. And that means fewer jobs uh, for regular folks. And so there's a very large question of how those jobs, of what's going to happen to those folks, um, and what jobs they're going to do, what, how the broader society uh, is going to be organized. And I have been saying for some years now that I think that is a huge challenge. It is not a huge challenge that means that technology is a bad thing. The Industrial Revolution led to huge changes in the structure of the society, and it required governments as well as entrepreneurs to do many of the things that were necessary. This revolution is going to require, over time, its Bismarcks, its Roosevelt's, its Gladstones, and we don't yet see the form, all the forms that that is going to take. But it would have been a historic tragedy if somebody had turned the Industrial Revolution off because they thought it was leading to displacement. And it would be a historic tragedy if this innovation revolution was to be uh, turned off. But it would equally be a historic error to suppose that because it was creating lots of new potentials and we had the miracle of the market, that all would be well. And we could just improve education and settle in and enjoy the good times. That's not to denigrate improving education, which is hugely important, but to say something is necessary is not to say that something is sufficient. And so I am all for the encouragement of uh, this uh, innovation. But I also think uh, that we need to recognize that it's going to come with a whole set of social consequences, and we as a society are going to have to prepare for those consequences. Thank you very much for the chance to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.